last week uh, I was back from Italy, but um, I had the opportunity to do uh, Pastor Scott's services. So I did uh, the nine over in Scottsdale in the back here and did 11 and one. The Lord had given me a, a sermon again while I was overseas in Italy, and I watched uh, the pastors. You know, if you travel to some of these countries, you'll find that along the beaches there are wonderful hotels and beautiful, and it seems like there's a lot of wealth. But if you travel inland, you find out that Italy, pretty much third world country, where uh, we traveled, went into churches, did five church conference one night, and church Sunday morning, Sunday night, another church the next Sunday. And so we were busy ministering the word. But for the most part, we found out that the pastors live in government housing. And the people, a lot of the people drive up in Mercedes and BMWs. They're the worst at receiving offerings of anybody I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so I had a good time. <laughs> Not that I'm a controversial figure, but Anyway, bless God. But out of something uh, just began as Dr. Maureen and I were studying, which is what we do on those times that we get away. And we found some things in the Word that I have never preached in all of the 45 years of teaching. Uh, I've been a pastor for 30 years at this church, 31 years. And uh, now turned it over to my two sons and... They're doing so good. I'm so proud of them. So fantastic. They take off where I left off. So I always feel like I leave the church in good hands. I never have to be concerned about them. But this is not a message that would come from a pastor. This would be a message that comes from an apostle. Now, I don't claim any particular title, and I don't really care about the title. It really means nothing except that I am out doing what apostles do. Uh, and so it doesn't matter. What the, I, please don't call me that. I don't, I, I'm not into titles. But I know what it is that I am called to do, take the word of grace and truth to the nation's his church, and, and that I'm still in training even on the grace message. We continue to be in training and learning and learning and learning. And so this message is, is dr directly associated with ministry, and it's, as I said, it's not something I have ever taught before. Uh, so I, I want you to lend me something called grace. Amen? Does that sound reasonable? Uh, grace never judges the justified. How many know you're justified if you're born again? Jesus' blood justified us. Grace never is offended with the justified. I'm saying all of this so that you don't have me for lunch. Grace, grace never holds on forgiveness. Amen. For the justified. God's called us to love one another. I mean, what would it be like if we actually followed those things? We wouldn't have the things that are going on in our nation today. If we could just simply all become Americans and assimilate to the way of life in this nation, no matter what our background is, just be an American, not of some race, creed, color, code, but just Americans loving one another, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it, what, what kind of a world would it be? Be absolutely awesome. And God set up something called a, this thing called a church. Amen. And the church was to bring all of us together as brothers and sisters. One of the terms that I, I don't particularly like is that this is my brother, but some people say brother of another mother. I don't like that because this is my brother in blood. 
This is my blood brother. I, I think we got to somehow get that into the body of Christ. This is what we are. The outward appearance means nothing to God. Everything that means something to God is what's in the heart. That's all, it, that's all that matters. For whatever f reason our flesh, which is corrupt, wants to do these things, judge and hold offense and live in unforgiveness. And, but you know that the flesh is corrupt. In fact, it's not redeemed. It's going back to dirt. It's your soul and spirit that were redeemed. Amen. And the Bible teaches us that we're not to live by the flesh, but we're supposed to live by the spirit. Wow. Couldn't that be cool? I mean, I think that'd be really cool. And we come to church so we can learn how to do that. And that's a responsibility of a pastor to to teach these things. I want them to put up on the screen Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> and let's take a look at these verses quickly. I know that you know these scriptures, but this is how the Lord gave it to me. So, And he himself, who is he talking about? We're talking about God himself, who is the word that Jesus spoke, or God spoke. He himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Who gave them? Well, God gave them. Why did he give them? Because he wanted someone that could train and to teach the saints or the body of Christ to grow up into the fullness of Christ. Simple. But it also says some, in other words, not everybody is one of those. Because if everybody was one of those, there'd be no congregation. This is really deep, I know. <laughs> Amen. Now, this is a message that I plan to take to the churches that are under our covering and the places that I travel this next year. And so this is not like, oh, this is specifically for, this is for the body of Christ. Do you all follow that? So I'm not looking for you to take it personal or, or any of those sorts of things. I want you to think of it as the church, the greater body of Christ. Amen? Oh, okay. So when we look at this, this is the, what we are called to do. We are to train up for the equipping, say equipping, of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's two things that are there. That we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's, this is what our responsibility as pastors, apostles, teachers, evangelists are supposed to do. This is, this is what we're called. And if you were to really think about it for a moment, I'm actually a gift to you. Yeah. Pastor Jason is a gift to the body here. Dr. Marine's a gift from God to the body here. Pastor Scott is a gift to the body of Christ here. We're, we're a gift. You, you may have the ability to receive those gifts or not. Certainly you have every right to have freedom of will, and that's correct. But we are a gift. The Bible says that no greater love has any man except that he lay down his life for another. Pastors, teachers, evangelists, and apostles have laid down their life. They're pastors 24-7, 365. There's no running. There's no getting away. You are walk through the airport in Rome and say, oh, you're Pastor Tom. I have to behave myself, even if the flight's late. <laughs> but we are a gift, and... And I'm not trying to build us up, but it's something that God has called us to do. Pastors are called to minister and equip the saints in the wealth, the prosperity, the goodness of God. That's what we're called to do. Now we'll go to Psalm 23 just quick. I know you know these as well. Psalm 23 verse 1 says, A Psalm of David, the Lord is my 
shepherd and I shall not want. One, there are three things that I would just want to say here in verse 1, 2, and 3, and that is, is that pastors have a responsibility to the sheep, believe it or not, to the goats and the wolves, because there is a hope and a prayer that you can change the wolves and goats into sheep. That takes a miracle, but those miracles still happen. So we teach the Word of God. He can't change them, but the Word of God can change them. Is that right? And so it's, he's the teach prosperity that God wants to meet all of your needs, but he wants to take you as Jehovah Jireh and meet everything that lines up with the Word of God, all of your wants. Now, that doesn't mean that if you want your neighbor's wife that you can have her. No, that's, these are wants that line up with the Word of God. Amen. So he wants to bring us into prosperity. So pastors have a responsibility to teach the people that God, Jesus became poor, that we might be made rich. That's a responsibility. Second thing, he said, he makes me to, to lie down in green pastures. In other words, if pastor has the responsibility to share a, a rich, healthy word of God, that's something that you can feed on and grow from. And he leads you beside, so that's Jehovah. He's providing the very best and powerful word to change and affect your life. Amen. And then he, what does it say? He makes me lay down in a green pasture and leads me beside still water. So we're to lead you to peace and to the goodness of God and the best life possible. And then it goes on and says, he restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So now you have Jehovah Rapha, your, your healer, healer of your soul. The word of God is to deal with all of the junk in your life. He's not to come up with a book of rules on how you're supposed to behave, but the word of God is to change your heart. And begin, he's wrote truth and wisdom on your heart. You, all you have to do is follow your heart. That's following the spirit. And he has a responsibility not only to do that, but his righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, not our own. So it's not about who we are and how good we do. So you have Jehovah Jireh, you have Jehovah Rapha, and you have Jehovah Shalom. Shalom also means prosperity, which means health, wealth, joy, peace, and highly favor. This is the reason that I've done health series. Now, some people got upset, didn't think it was spiritual. Well, if you don't want to work on your health and do what you need to do, then you just die early and go to heaven. It's okay. But I'm just saying, we have a responsibility to teach in these areas. This is what God's called us as under shepherds. The Lord is your shepherd, but I'm your under. Jeff, Pastor Jason, your under shepherd. Been assigned to this congregation, just as pastors are assigned to a congregation. Now, any one of pastors that I know worldwide could do a lot of other things and still be successful and do great things. But they chose to follow the call of God, which meant that they had to lay down their desires their, in order to find God's destiny for them. So they laid down their life for a congregation. That's pretty awesome. If you think about it, there's a lot of other things that pastors could do. Now, they're called, and they accept the call. But a lot have accepted the call, but not waited to grow and become chosen. And when they haven't waited to become chosen, they end up leading sheep, goats, and wolves astray and become more destructive to the body of Christ than constructive. But if they are and wait and grow, there was a reason that God had me wait until I was 70 before I could turn the church over to my sons. Because I had to know in my heart that they were trained in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18. That they had to become fortified cities, which means they have everything inside of themselves to be able to do what God's called them to do and not to crumble under the weight. They were called to be iron pillars. I had to become an iron pillar to sustain great weight. People say, oh, that big church, isn't that really difficult? No, it's a blast. I'm having a wonderful time. I don't moan and groan under the weight. 
Go down and talk to a pillar down here by the freeway at 101. Big semis are going over. He say, how's it going for you? It's pretty rough, huh? No, this pillar's going to say, this is what I was, I was called to do. This is what I was built for. Are you following me? And then he made us, not only that, he made us a bronze wall. And a bronze wall just simply makes a good noise. It's not made out of pure metal. So if you think we're all perfect, you're wrong. If you start looking for the perfection, you're wrong. We're messengers that bring the word of God. And we make a good noise. Even my singing is just barely a good noise. Come on now. Now, the reason that he makes us a fortified city, iron pillar and a bronze wall, is so that we can endure and sustain a congregation. It's so that we can endure the wolves and the goats. That we'll be able to surpass and love them even in the midst of their destructions. And that takes some time, it takes some growing. Is anybody home? Okay. Now, I'm saying all of this for specific reasons, and I want to take you to it so that it's something you can take home with you. It's through blood, sweat, and tears that a pastor lays his life down. He's criticized at every corner for about everything he does, and he can't always explain why he does what he does because that would be revealing someone else's sin. So he becomes blamed for whatever circumstance or situation that went on. Hallelujah. It's just kind of interesting the position that God puts us in as we have to love. Amen. Even though we would rather slap them. <laughs> but I want you to think about this specifically as we get into some more of the word. Pastors sow, teachers sow, evangelists sow, apostles sow. We sow the most powerful wealth there is on the face of this earth and in the universe into your hearts every Sunday. The most powerful wealth that there is, is the Word of God. And we're here to sow it into your life, not your head, but into your heart. It's the Holy Spirit that takes it and plants it in your heart. It has the power to change your life and make tomorrow better than today. We sow the Word that holds the universe together that is so powerful that when it's received and believed, can heal your body, raise the dead, bring joy like you've never known, peace in the midst of a storm. It has power to change every area of your life. Why don't people come every Sunday? When I, and I know my sons and my wife, we spend a minimum of 20 hours preparing for you. 20 hours, and then people decide to sleep in. When there was power to change their life and make their tomorrows better, watching the football game won't do it. Another hour of sleep won't do it. Come on, somebody. But we've invested and ready to invest in your heart. Go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. And I'm reading from the TCP, but you'll be reading from the New King James on the screen. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, it says, And those who are taught, that would be y'all, the word of God will receive an impartation from the teacher and a sharing of wealth. Get it now? A sharing of wealth will take place. A sharing of the wealth of the word that goes to your heart and changes your life is coming from the pulpit, 
prepared just for you. But there's an important word here called sharing. Hello? Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 11. He said, if we've given any spiritual thing to you, if we've given any spiritual thing to you, whether it's prayer at the altar or the word that's been preached or somebody greeting or somebody speaking a word of encouragement in the body, if we've given anything spiritual to you, is it any great thing if we reap from you material things? Mm, is it any great thing that we, you begin to share your wealth with the house of God? The devil makes it look like we're getting it. But it was set up so the spiritual wealth sharing is his word goes forth and you finance his word. That's the sharing of the wealth. That's why there's an offering and that's why there's tithes and that's why we have this in the service. Yet the enemy comes along and says, oh, see, they're just after your money. And then they get upset because the pastor got a nice house or a nice car. Listen, if I, had, if I lived in a shack, there'd be somebody who's got a poorer shack than I got. If I drove an old junk car, there'd be somebody who got an older, junkier car than I got. There's no way of winning that battle. You can't do it. Hallelujah. Is it any great thing that if we've given you the best of the best of the wealth of life, that you might share a little bit back into the house of God as he, as he has invested in your life, you have the opportunity to invest in his. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 4, it says this, Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do pastors not have a right? This is what Paul the Apostle is preaching here. Preach it in two places, in Corinthians and Galatians, those two particular churches. Is it any, do we not have a right to eat and to drink? Oh, I'm not given today, you just want my money. Does the pastor who provides this not have a right to a paycheck? Does he not have the right to be able to pay the mortgage on the building? Does he not have the right to pay his staff so that his staff's children have food, a home, and a car? Does he not have, instead we want to just let him worry about it and let him figure out how it can be paid? And cause him to die young because he's carried such a heavy load. Hello? Interesting approach to this. I know you're having so much fun out there. But when we think about this, here's the reason that it's not taught more. Here's the reason I have not taught this as your pastor. Here's the reason Pastor Scott and Jason or Pastor Maureen would probably ever teach this. Watch what it says. In verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. If others are partakers of the right, in other words, you send your money all over the world, but you don't put anything in your church, are we not all the more worthy of it? Nevertheless, we have not used this right but instead we endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Did you hear what that said? What that's saying is the reason that this is not taught readily in the church is because there could be somebody new that came in the church that believes they're just after your money and you drive them back out of the house and they never get saved. This is the reason that it's never taught. But Paul found out that he had to teach it at least in Corinthians. He had to teach it at least once in Galatians, 
because the people needed to be informed of truth and how God set up his program so that his program can finance and take the gospel to the world. This is, this is his program. I didn't, I didn't write this. I'm just telling you what's in the Bible. And I'm delivering it not as a pastor. I'm delivering it as an apostle to churches. And trust me, I'm taking this to churches all over the world. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says this. Make no mistake about it. God will never be mocked. For what you plant will be the very thing that you harvest. The harvest you reap reveals the seed that you're sowing. Now, pastors understand this at a very early age in the ministry. When we see people going through hell, we know what they've sowed. And then they want us to bail them out with somebody else's tithe money. I'm just telling you truth today. Is that okay? This is important for the body of Christ to grasp. The seed that you sow reveals as we look at the harvest you live. Now, everybody ought to really consider this. If you want your tomorrows to be better, then it becomes critical that you sow the right seed. If you want your marriage to be better, you have to sow the right seed into your marriage. And you'll get the right harvest. But if you sow criticism and all sorts of other negative things into your marriage, you can expect to reap a harvest of a divorce. It, seed time and harvest you will have forever, God said. There's no getting away from how it works. You can blame God for it, but really, we're at fault. Y'all okay? And then it goes on, it says, if you plant the corrupt seed of the self-life into the natural realm, you can, experience to, you can expect to experience a harvest of corruption. This is something that has gone on in our nation. Thursday night, I almost brought it up, and then I decided to rephrase it. Listen to what I said again. If you plant corrupt seed of the self-life into the natural realm, you can expect to experience a harvest of corruption. If we continue to pull God out of our school system, we continue to pull God out of our government, continue to pull God out of, out of the Pledge of Allegiance, we continue to pull God out of things, here's what the word corruption means. Now, so many people think that corruption is like, you know, it's uh, Valentine, St. Valentine's Day and, uh, and, you know, Al Capone and everybody, a lot of blood and a lot of people getting killed. No, actually, the word corruption in the Greek, this is what it reads like. It means to bring into an inferior or worsening condition. It has the effect of withdrawing life. And we can see that happening in our nation. Because we're not sowing into God, we are withdrawing from God. And as a result, we withdraw life from our nation. We see it in our economy. We see it in our schools. We see it on our streets. We're seeing it everywhere because you're pulling more and more about God out. And we're sowing more and more into self. And we can see the results. Well, if we can see it at a national level, we should be able to see it in our own lives. We got at least three amens on that. But this is the good news. If you plant the good seed to the spirit life in the house of God, 
you will reap the beautiful harvest and the fruit that grows up out of the everlasting life that the Spirit has brought to you in salvation. He desires for you to prosper. He wants you to have too much. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be filled. But you've got to do it His way. There's no other way that you can accomplish it. You have to do it God's way. We've got to... In when you invest in his kingdom, he will invest in yours. And there's no getting around how it works. This is my God. He set up a program. He's a good God. He only has good in store for us. He desires for us. So I speak to you. Love your pastor. Love your church. Amen. Love your God. Love your life. Love life. Could we ever get to the place where we love life and value life? Yeah, I kind of went there on Thursday night too, but we got we got it out here. So if you give your tithe and your offering into the house, listen to how it works. When you give your tithe and offering into the house, it feeds you abundant life. Tithers know this. It feeds you. That's why God said, "Bring your tithes and offering." that there might be food in my house. And then we consume the food that brings greater and greater abundant life. This is how God set up his plan. It's a beautiful plan. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I don't want anyone to feel condemned by this sermon by any sense. If you've never given before, God forgives and forgets, but it's a good time to start financing the house of God. It's time to do something different than you've been doing. This is not about living word. This is about the greater church of Jesus worldwide. That's the only way the gospel is. It's only God that can change this nation. It's not who's going to be elected. It's going to be God that changes this nation. Come on, somebody. That's, if it, my people humble themselves and pray. Amen. Start getting behind the God system. You're going to be amazed at what God's going to do in returning us back to a wonderful nation. Amen. If you got anything out of that, give the Lord a hand clap. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. We thank you for truth of your word. We ask, Lord, that you bless it to every heart and encourage every heart. Let there be no condemnation whatsoever, Lord, but it is just the truth from your word to be applied in our lives so that we can gain the abundant life that you want us to have. We just give you praise and we give you glory. And we desired to sow the goodness of love into people. We sow joy into people, peace into people, peace, peace into this world. We sow our finances into the kingdom of God. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you multiply every good thing that we sow and we give you praise and glory for. Because you said it in your word, I can believe it, I can claim it, and I can live it. And I know, Lord, I thank you personally that I live it, that I am blessed beyond blessed. And I thank you, Father, for it. in Jesus' name. If you haven't received Jesus as Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me. Everyone praying aloud, just repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.